life is writing a story, and that story is connected to my story, and my story is connected to your story, and our story then, this collective story, has been unfolding over the past five years. Here's what I believe to my core. Over the past five years, the story that is being written is not a story of one person or of one family. Did you know this? It's not the story of me. It is the collective stories of we. And as I've been thinking over the past number of weeks, the month of October is a month where it's like lifetime channel month for me. I just sit around and cry a lot because I remember all that God has done over the past years. And so I've been thinking about all the stories, the we stories that have been unfolding over the past five years. A number of thoughts come to mind. Stories of setting up chairs to taking down stage decks. Can I get a witness on that? How many of you remember those days? Yes. Some of you still flinch when you hear stage deck, right? Those of you that are new, man, like you got it easy, all right? You just show up and it's awesome and it's easy, all right? But we used to do some work around here. We used to carry these heavy stage decks. Uh, we used to set up chairs. Stories I think of of holding doors open, right? And also stories of holding babies. It's incredible to think about how many doors have been held open. And it's incredible to think about how many babies have been held over the past five years. I love those stories. Stories of serving kids. How many of you guys have been serving and mission kids at some point over the last five years? I know a ton of you guys have. Stories of serving students. Uh, stories of leading groups. We are a church that is all about community. Today is one-seventh of the vision. We, we really believe that God's church is meant to be 365. It's meant to be a church without walls. It's meant to be a church that never sleeps. It's meant to be a church that is on the move seven days a week, right? And so therefore we have groups and it's stories of those of you that have led groups. It's also stories of those of you that have been leading teams on the weekend. You've been taking care of God's house. You've been leading people. You've been leading teams. You've been giving people the gift and the opportunity to be really surprised by grace on Sundays. I think of stories of fire pits. I thought I was going to get an amen. Um, <laughs> And I also think of stories of fireworks, throwing a party for our whole city the past number of years. Stories of running lights uh, in this room, even mid-song, if you were paying attention, this last song, right? Uh, stories also of running marathons. How many of you have run a marathon in the past five years for clean water and your legs are still sore? Yes, absolutely. Uh, close to a couple hundred of us, I think, have done that. Amazing. Uh, stories of what it was like, I remember this, stories of what it was like to buy a brand new 32-foot trailer. It was the nicest, top-of-the-line trailer. And stories of what it was like three weeks later to get that same trailer stolen. Yeah. yeah, I remember that story. Some of you weren't here then, but we remember that story, and we remember what that was like. Stories of what it was like to pray for and financially fund a brand-new church. I want you guys to think just right now that in West Chicago, Renewal Church, as we're celebrating our fifth, they're celebrating their first. It's an incredible thing to think that God has used you to do this. The way that God's worked in our hearts to say, man, we're just like this whole territorialism, competition between churches, it's just, that's like old, right? We need a new narrative being written in our city. And that is that we are for the church. And we want to do anything and everything that we can to see gospel-centered churches started and thriving all over the world. And so we were part of that. We were part of that. Stories of late-night conversations. And certainly over the past few months, stories of early morning prayer. Stories of eating together. We're at eating church. It's one of the things we're best at. Stories of eating together. And also stories of grieving together. I mean, there, there has been a number of you guys that have walked through the valley over the past five years, but you haven't walked through it alone. We've grieved together. Stories of gathering at Stratford Middle School for the last time. You guys remember that? And stories of walking into this space for the first time. Stories of sorting toys with the Holiday Gift Mart, right? And uh, it's a pretty exciting thing that we do. That's going to kick off next Sunday. We're excited to talk to you about that. Stories of sorting toys, but also stories of filling backpacks through Project Just Start. Stories of serving the 10, right? We love the 10. We love to serve the 10. And also stories of contributing toward the 300. Stories of saying, will you marry me for the first time? In fact, there was someone that got engaged on our stage, right? And someone that got married in, as they were getting baptized. You got to check out the video archive. It was an incredible thing. So we've seen this in our midst, right? Stories 
of people saying, will you marry me for the first time? And also stories of renewing your vows last year and saying, will you marry me for all time? We have been seeing incredible stories unfolding over the past five years, collective stories, the story that is being written through the we, through us, Mission Church. You could make a book out of these stories, and in fact, that's exactly what we're going to do. And so as you guys walked in this morning, you were offered one of these, and I understand some of you resisted it. You're like, no, that you, I don't understand. I'm trying to help us with this. If we ever offer you something, it's not bad, right? It's not like laced with something. You're not going to get sick, all right? Um, we offered you this, okay? And you're going to need one of these. You're going to need one of these. In fact, if you don't have one of these, as you came in, and maybe you're busy or talking, all right? Uh, if, you don't, if you didn't get one of these, make sure and raise your hand right now, and our team is going to bring you one. Here's why. Here in a couple minutes, I'm going to give you a few minutes to chronicle your story over the past five years. And we're going to keep these on your way out. You're going to put them in the giving box, and we're going to make a book out of them. And it's going to become our five-year Mission Church book. And it's going to be awesome where we can flip through it and we can read the collective stories that God has been writing in our midst. And so I'm going to give you guys a minute here in a few minutes to write those down. If you didn't get some of these on your way in, raise your hand uh, and be ready for that here in a few minutes. We're going to do that. And, and so before we do that, before you write about your story, I've been gifted the opportunity as the lead pastor to also probably be the lead enthusiast of stories. I've been gifted the opportunity to have a front row seat of watching so many different kinds of stories unfold over the last five years. And, and just for a minute, I, I want to kind of highlight the kinds of stories. I want to use the word story as an acronym. There's five letters to it as a, as a way to kind of talk about the, the key themes, maybe the top five themes of the kinds of stories that have been unfolding over the past five years. The first is stories of service. I mean, you guys flat out serve. Did you know this about yourself? It is unbelievable. Since the beginning, this has been a church where we've said we will not be a sideline spectating kind of group. That's not this kind of church. We've been saying since the beginning that the view from the field is way better and it's way more impactful. This is a, a service kind of church, stories of service, watching you guys over the past five years dive in, watching you jump into serving roles that you didn't know how to do, but you said, train me up, I'm ready. Watching you guys over the last five years show up with metaphorically a towel over your arm saying, wait, it is way more blessed to give than to receive. I want to serve. I want to look more like Jesus as I get into the trenches of ministry. I have seen and we have seen stories of service. We've also seen and I've also seen stories of transformation. You're not the same person you were when you first walked in these doors. Man, and I'm going to get real emotional if I let myself here just looking at some of your faces. Man, you're not the same person that you were when you first walked through these doors. Stories of transformation. This hasn't been a story of you just getting better. It hasn't been a story of you just trying harder. It's been a story of you allowing God to transform your life. Stories of transformation. I mean, look at how you now relate to your wife. You did not love her like this a few years ago. You didn't. Look at how you talk to your kids and play with your kids and invest in your kids. Look at how you now feel and know that you are, yes, saved, but you're also sent. And so wherever your feet take you, that is where the church just showed up. And so you enter the workplace totally different. Why? Because you're being transformed. You now see your street totally different. It's not just a place where you live. It's a place where you've been sent. And so you are a beacon of hope and mercy where you live. I mean, look at what God has done in your story. Stories of transformation. Also stories of, of open-handed generosity. Open-handed generosity. I'm telling you guys, you don't realize this, but this is a generous church. You have been doing this for the past five years. You've been opening your hands and you've been giving and stewarding what our culture worships. You've been saying, God, I want you to use my resources that I for I want you to use them to advance your kingdom here in the tent as it is in heaven. You've had hands like this, wide open hands of generosity. So many of you, you now tithe. There was a day when that was such a foreign concept. You used to want to fight me about this, right? But now you actually do this. You now live by this 10, 10, 80 principle, and it hasn't ruined your life. In fact, it has been about transforming your life in a lot of ways. You're a generous person. Think 
of all that God has done, as I mentioned, the different organizations that we have been able to support, churches, other churches, not just renewal, that we've been able to give our whole offerings to at times. We're a church like this, and I've watched your stories unfold over the past five years, stories of open-handed generosity. A couple more. Stories of restoration. Do you remember, do you remember the shape you were in when you first walked in these doors? I mean, you guys were broken and bleeding. I mean, do you remember how resistant you were to the church? Do you remember how afraid you were to trust the church again because how the church had wounded you? Do you remember the shape that you were in? Do you remember the place your family was in? Do you remember the, the place your marriage was in? Do you remember the environment and climate of your home or of your dorm room when you first got here? But look at what God has done. God has been writing a restorative story through your life. It's been a story of newness. It's been a story of new things. So many of you, you would say when you first walked into these doors, you were a prisoner of your past, but now it's different. You've been set free, free, forever you're free. Why? Because God is writing a restorative story through your life. And the story ends with the last letter, Y. I've seen stories of yes. The power of yes. And we've been seeing this, haven't we? That we can never underestimate the power and potential of what is on the other side of yes. And you've been saying yes to crazy things. You've been saying yes to running a really long distance for clean water. You've been saying yes to open your hands. You've been saying yes to walking across the street. You've been saying yes to lighting up a fire pit in your driveway. You've been saying yes to intentionally moving into the tent. You're that crazy. You've actually been doing that. And you've been saying yes to volunteer and serve in all kinds of ways. You've been saying yes to Jesus Christ. You've been saying yes to prioritize his presence. You've been saying yes to be guided and fed through the word of God. You've been saying yes to Jesus, that he is not just a good teacher, but he, in fact, is savior and leader of your life. Think of all the ways that you have said yes over the past five years. Think of it. I mean, what a story God is writing through your life. Think of the collective stories that are unfolding in our midst. And I want to give you, like I said I would do, three minutes. And maybe that template, that, the kind of acronym of story helps you kind of think about some themes. And I want you to do this. I want you to take this serious. Uh, reflecting on what God has been doing is one of the most transformative things in your story, for the record. And so we want to give you, as a gift, a few minutes to reflect on this. And some of you are like, John, I've only been here for like like 15 minutes. I've been here for five years. Here's what I believe. I actually believe God has still been at work within your story. Mission Church is a church, but it's just a church, okay? There's a lot of other great churches maybe you've been a part of. Or maybe you've never been to church before. I still believe that something has been unfolding in your story over the past five years. Maybe write that down. If you're here for the first time, you're now part of our story, right? Some of you, maybe it's just five months. Others of us, others of us it's been five years. But what and how could you chronicle in a few minutes some key themes of what has been unfolding through your story over the past five years? We're going to give you guys a few minutes, and then our band will be back up, and we'll continue our celebration. October 9, 2011 started out like most days, an early morning walk with the dogs. Walking home through the parking lot of Stratford Middle School, I heard music. It was beautiful and stopped me in my tracks. I paused for a moment to listen before continuing our walk home. At home, I shared with my daughter that I had heard music coming from the school. She told me she had seen a sign about some church called Mission that was meeting there. Little did I know, this day would be a new beginning, a beginning that I could barely fathom, much less think or dream of. I had given my life to God about six months earlier, but it wasn't really going so well. I hadn't found a church that I felt welcomed at or accepted. The only way I can describe what happened on this Sunday was a God intervention. I walked into the gymnasium of a middle school full of strangers. I didn't know anyone, but these strangers were different. They were all so friendly and welcoming. A young man took the stage and introduced himself. He said, hi, my name is John and I'm the lead pastor. He started his message out by saying, what if we could be a church that met you where you are? It didn't matter what you did last night, 
last week or last year, I remember thinking, really, wow, but you don't know me, and if you did, you wouldn't feel this way. But at the same time, it was the mustard seed of hope that I had been searching for. Here is what I have learned in the last five years. I'm the daughter of the one true king, the maker of heaven and earth. The lies that I'd been told about my mistakes and sins could never be forgiven, they were just that, they were lies. Oh, how I have learned what God's love and grace, mercy, forgiveness, and redemption looks like and feels. God has provided answers to questions that I have been searching for. God has reaffirmed that loving his people and being, for his, being there for his people is exactly what he needs from me. Serving God's people makes my heart burst with utter unspeakable joy. Surrendering my life and putting God first saved me from being the depressed, suicidal, broken-hearted woman in despair to being redeemed and set free. I am Mama Marge, and this is my story. Four years ago, I was fresh out of college, starting my first job in a promising career, a newly married man, and living in Carroll's dream. Full of ambition, I thought I was on a fast track to completing all of life's significant milestones, but I began to sink into a deep depression. I became less available to my wife, living two completely different lives. One outside that showed my positive outlook and hope for the future, and one inside that couldn't stop doubting if there even was a God or purpose in this life. And then God stepped in. On recommendation from a coworker, we walked through the doors of Mission Church and instantly I knew this is where we needed to be. The vision for the tent turned Carroll Stream from a random city into a place we were sent to. The mission staff and partners were contagious with energy and love for every person who walked through those doors and even those who hadn't walked in yet. And I wanted that. And so we kept showing up on Sundays, inevitably compelled to begin serving and invited to join a mission group. Despite our anxiety about student loan debt, we felt convicted to give, and at home, we felt inspired to live on mission with our neighbors. Mission pressed and challenged us that we are not simply here to do church, but to be the church. And that happens when we have an intimate relationship with Jesus and are compelled to follow his mission of making disciples. I finally began to see God at work in all of it, writing a grand story for all of the world and a completely unique story just for me. I simultaneously felt so valued and loved and yet so much a part of a grander story that was bigger than myself. God has shown me with Mission Church how much he loves me no matter where I am at, in deep depression or peak performance. He has assured me that his vision for the world is the greatest story ever told and it ends with his family together for eternity. I can rest in this truth that I am a son of the King. I've been called off the sidelines and into the game to follow Jesus in the Missio Dei, in my family, in my neighborhood, at work, and to the ends of the earth. I have decided to follow Jesus, and I won't stop inviting others to join me. My name is Reed Hutchison, and this is my story. I am 16 years old and a follower of Jesus Christ. Three and a half years ago, I never thought a description of myself would even have the look of religion in it. When I was 13, I was already exposed to bullying, a witness of my parents' separation, and a victim of self-hate and oppression. Before my 14th birthday, I tried to commit suicide, and years before that, I have isolated myself to self-harm and bulimia because of my lack of self-worth and confidence. June 24, 2014, I took a bottle of Advil and swallowed my pride and 15 pills to balance it all out. I was rushed to the hospital and prayed to God that I didn't know existed yet to take me and my pain and suffering as I tried to leave this earth. But he had a different plan. He told me to wake up and see what I was doing. I spent three and a half weeks in a hospital with nothing other than clothes from home and a Bible that Jessica Bowman gave me from Mission Church as she visited me on my first night. As I, did, as I laid in my room, all I did was read. I tried to understand what God was trying to do to me. Would he ever forgive me? That's why I kept reading and praying because my biggest fear was losing someone who once loved me and thinking I wasn't worth their love anymore. With God, I found a new way to describe myself and a new passion. And if you seek him, he will come and find you. I'm 16 now and a proud believer of the one true God. And I'm also two years clean of self-harm. I still suffer from depression and anxiety every day of my life. But with God, there's a weight lifted off my shoulders. God has shown me a new path. And without reading the Bible for those three and a half weeks, I don't know where I'd be now. 
and now I have hope, faith, and a little bit of laughter in my life. I've read in Isaiah 9 too that the people that live in the darkness have seen a great light, and they that dwell in the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. My name is Hannah Bonilla, and this is my story. My story begins almost five years ago when what I thought was a simple invitation turned into the beginning of a transformation of my life. My neighbor invited me to check out Mission Church. I never grew up in a church, but it seemed very intriguing, so I began to come. John's messages resonated with me, and it literally felt like each message every week was custom made just for me. I began to build a relationship with God that I never thought could really exist. The Bible became my handbook, constantly seeking answers for the many questions that I was flooded with. My connection with God became very real. I kept thinking, what was next? Where is this trust and faith going to bring me? That's when the idea of complete surrender through baptism came into my mind. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I needed to do this. I was being called to tell everyone how in love with God I had become. On September 9, 2012, my life as I knew it had a new beginning through baptism, a new purpose to walk every day, striving for righteousness and seeking what God had planned for me next. Serving people, my family and I, we serve God with a deeper purpose now. We serve through people, hoping to change the lives of others with perhaps a simple invite like the one that was extended to me. As Mission Church celebrates five years transforming lives, I celebrate the almost five years of a new one. My name is Jim Tricka. This is my story. Two and a half years ago, my, fam my family walked into Mission Church, basically because we didn't have anything else to do that day. We weren't looking for a church, but I'm pretty sure that this church was looking for us. As we walked out of our car that first snowy morning, I was overwhelmed by the warmth that I felt. But when my husband turned to me and said, you wanna come back next week? I was even more overwhelmed. I remember the distinct feeling that I actually wanted to go to church, and I had one that instantly felt like home. It wasn't long before I took a step to serve with Mission Kids, and then soon after I joined a mission group. Within both of these areas, I learned that God was speaking through so many people around me. And as I looked around, I saw those people and the faces that God used to speak to me. I could not deny God's presence when people prayed with me as someone I loved battled a heroin addiction. I saw Christ's love when my husband had the courage to tell me that something was broken in our marriage. I felt God hold me as friends sent me songs and prayers. He is here and he's speaking through friends that I have met at mission. He helps them keep me accountable and make me realize that I'm loved even if my laundry isn't done or I get angry with people around me. I have learned to hear his gentle whispers and see his little winks. But what really knocks me out is when my neighbors and coworkers point out the change. Whether it's the man I've never met that lives down the street and stops by our lemonade stand and he tells me that something's changed in this house over the last three years, or the anonymous person who left two backpacks at my doorstep, I get the privilege to live a life that demonstrates love. Following Christ leaves an undeniable mark on our community. As my coworkers ask me to share how I'm able to see the best in others or press pause when considering the stories of other people, I am now able to point them to the best answer with confidence and assurance. And that answer is Jesus. My name is Kathy Rosalvo, and this is my story. Thank you.